OK, so song is learned. All the birds out there that you hear singing, they all learned their songs. They don't know it innately. If you raise, as you'll see in a moment, there's lots of evidence that the birds need access first to an auditory stimulus. Uh, they create a memory uh, of the song model. And then they have to listen. So that's one phase of song learning early in development. And then they have to listen to their own auditory feedback. And they slowly develop the song over a long period of time. So does that sound, that developmental uh, process, does it sound similar to anything that you've encountered before? Well, it's how you learn to speak, right? And it's how you acquire speech and language. So it's a very interesting model in, 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 in that regard as well. So uh, here are you know, classic examples. As you go tromping along the coastline of California, you find that birds in a given geographical locale, these are now white crown sparrows, uh, all singing the same song type up in Marin County. Uh, before, there was lots of wine up there. Uh, now you go to uh, the Berkeley campus, and the birds are all singing a somewhat different song type, but they're all singing a similar song type. And down in sunset, sunset beat, yet, yet a third song type. Okay? It's a tough life having to go to all those places and record singing birds. Yeah? Uh, but now it's very interesting. If you take, so this is what the structure of white crowned sparrow songs look like, unmanipulated. But now you take a juvenile bird, and all you do is early in development, you prevent the bird from hearing a normal song type. And this might be the song of that adult bird, or this or that. And they're clearly extremely abnormal. Now, the song these, these isolate birds will sing will not be variable. It will also be stereotyped and fixed, but it's very aberrant. Okay? If instead you take the young bird and you deafen it so that it can't hear its auditory feedback, that's extremely disruptive to the song, and there's variability on a bout-by-bout -bout basis. These are powerful influences on uh, song development, and they lead to um, uh, a sort of a simple model, so the so-called template theory of bird song learning. There's a model the animal, uh, uh, in the brain, an acoustic or sensory model. The animal gains access to it by auditory feedback, uh, and so on and so forth. I want to play a couple of songs to you to give you a more sort of visceral sense of uh, um, these effects. So we're now, once again, going to listen to the song of an adult zebra finch, that terrible, miserable song. It's like Bugs Bunny in a squeaky door, sort of compounded, right? Uh, and now this is a normal song, too, of a zebra finch. It's normal, but it's the song of a young bird learning to sing. It's plastic. It's variable. It's like babbling in humans. And here's the song of an adult bird, another adult zebra finch. Right, you don't have to be an expert to know something's really wrong there. That bird was raised in isolation of exposure to the tutor song and sang this song type. Okay. And he won't change it as an adult if he hears normal songs. They can't make that change. So these are very powerful influences on the networks related to the behavior. And this becomes you know, a pretty interesting system and one that we want to model. And maybe all this information can uh, tell us about. So you know, I'm going to skip over the next two slides. They're fascinating. They're things you can do with birdsong learning. Uh, but they're not exactly germane to our goal. So you can learn things about song development and speech development that we didn't know before. You can learn about how cultures emerge that we didn't know before because you have a practical system for analyzing. But maybe I'll talk about can, it later. Can a bird from one place in California uh, be transferred to another and learn different songs? So if it's the same species, yes. Or if it's a species that sings a similar song type, there are mechanisms for birds being sep birds again sympatric species that is species of the same territory learning the right song the song of the right species and a lot of that has to do with social interaction uh, but there are also limits you can't teach a zebra finch to sing like a canary if only you could um, 
or uh, uh, across. So you can't, you know, they, they, there are limits to what they can do. And we can't sing like canaries, do sort of a modest job of it. Or is, well, so we can learn Japanese, but with an accent. And this is actually related. Uh, we could talk a lot more about that. What are the constraints of our perceptual space? So when you were young, you could learn Japanese perfectly well if you weren't exposed to the sounds during a, a critical period of song development. You lose the ability. You don't lose it completely. That's a myth. And so it turns out there's a lot of train. There's a, there's a lot we now know about how we can train to uh, uh, acquire different sounds. But typically, a, a foreign speaker will speak with an accent that a native speaker will always be able to detect. Okay, so there are limits on it. And that's very much related. This is the science of that, the neurobiology of that. So it's a very interesting uh, uh, system to study in that regard. OK, now the, the, the one uh, thing that, uh, uh, for all those other wonderful studies, um, um, the ability now to bring song development under strong experimental control was very important. So in this uh, paradigm that was developed, a uh, juvenile bird is raised in isolation until it's independent of the parents. That is, it's able to feed by itself. It's then put in a cage with a dummy bird uh, uh, that's a nice model of a zebra finch. Uh, and, um, um, and then these uh, keys are uncovered. And if the bird pecks the key, it hears a song. And the first time it ever will hear uh, a normal uh, species typical song, it'll have a very powerful influence on the birds. The birds will swoon. Some of them will actually fall asleep. It's a very powerful influence. It's like, oh, wow, you know, what's this amazing thing that just happened? And uh, it turns out that if you regulate the number of songs the bird hears, keep it down uh, to a very small number, you can drive song learning quite effectively in the laboratory. And you can, within constraints we were just talking about, you can drive the bird's uh, uh, song in any direction. Just like any human being can acquire the, uh, any human language uh, early enough in life, similarly, any zebra finch, as best as we know, can acquire any zebra finch song if it's exposed at the right time in the right way early in life. Okay. So now, if you look at that song development, you'll see that um, uh, this is now a measure of the overall structure of the song, the variance of the entropy across the, uh, the, the uh, bouts of singing. And what you see is that it's low variance, which means that there's not much structure in it, not much variation in it. And then after you chew to the bird, the, the song starts to get more complex, the entropy variance changes, and this is part of the developmental trajectory. But if you now look instead at individual days, the variation across individual days, what you find is that early in the morning, the songs are less complicated. They get more complicated during the day, and they're maintained that way. And then after the bird goes to sleep and wakes up again, the songs are less complicated again, further away from the tutor song that the animal is trying to achieve. And then the, the animal goes through this again. This variation is driven by sleep itself. It's not a. Um, uh, chronological or a um, circadian effect. It's actually driven by sleep itself. If you experimentally get an animal uh, to sleep during the day, then when the animal wakes up, again, it'll be singing a song with low variance, even though it sh should normally be singing a song uh, with high variance and more structure at that point. If you uh, um, uh, deprive the animal uh, uh, from sleep, uh, you can move these periods around. And the most compelling thing is that those birds that show the largest variation here, those are the ones that learn the best. So this is not maladaptive. This is highly adaptive. And again, if we want to get a biologically realistic network, we need to incorporate the effects of sleep in learning as well as the effects of daytime activity. to do with the fact that while you're sleeping, the muscles are inactive, and then it requires some, some time along the day to activate or act or. Right, so that when you wake up, there's what we call, right, 
there's what we call sleep inertia. Uh, but we know that that's not uh, uh, a, uh, a plausible uh, explanation. Uh, the animals first are singing hundreds of times in the morning, so they're quite active. But we do actually see that the very first songs have some special characteristics to them that are related to that phenomenon. You know how when you wake up, you're not fully awake? That, we call that sleep inertia. It takes a while before all parts of the system are awake and are working cooperatively. So what, what can we learn about the nervous system here? So um, if we look carefully, what we see is that when we expose the bird to the tutor song, the singing behavior doesn't change on that day. It changes the next day after the animal has slept and woken up. And we see that both in averages across birds, and we can see that in individual birds as well. If we now record from that RA structure that we were talking about a while ago and record the bursting activity of the cells while the animal sleeps at night, what we see is that in these young birds, the bursting changes the first night after the bird was exposed to the tutor song. But that first night is before the change in behavior, which will start to be exhibited the next morning. So this ties, causally ties, the changes in the motor system to the changes in uh, the singing behavior itself. And, um, and it's, it's a more complex process than that. The structure of the bursting depends on which tutor song the bird was exposed to. And if you take a bird that was exposed to one tutor song, like song three, and then expose them to another tutor song, like song one, the pattern of activity uh, that the bird uh, 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 exhibited changes in the uh, appropriate direction. If you go from song one to song three, it also changes in the appropriate direction. So it's not just that it's related to singing, but it's carrying information about the tutor song. And it's even more complicated than that, because the bird needs to be able to hear himself sing to drive those changes I was just showing you. So in a variety of experimental ways, if we allow the bird to sing but prevent him from hearing his feedback, then the changes don't occur. And then once we allow the bird to hear the feedback, this young bird to hear the feedback, then the changes in the uh, brain occur. So all the features of birdsong learning, right? Uh, the development, the effect of the uh, sensory exposure to song, uh, and, uh, and the effects of auditory feedback, they're all captured uh, in, in this experiment. Okay. If we look in adult birds, we see what's called neuronal replay. So here is now again, these are birds singing high quality, uh, well, stereotype song. So up at the top there, there's the song of the bird. There's the pattern of activity of one RA neuron, like you heard previously in the video, uh, uh, firing away when the bird is singing. And now we were able to hold that one cell, which is hard to do, for many, many hours. The bird fell asleep. And now again, spontaneously, the bird gave this discharge just a few times. Uh, 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 a discharge this complex. This isn't driven by singing. This is during the bird's sleep. And you see how the pattern of the neuron's activity is very similar to the pattern the same neuron produced when the animal was singing. So the bird, you know, the way this was picked up in the press, the bird is dreaming of singing. Uh, well, so we don't know what the animal is actually experiencing when he sleeps, but it does capture the essential flavor of it. And we see that in uh, uh, any cell we look at, and people have now seen evidence for this in other parts of the, of the, song, brain, the song system as well. Uh, so this is feedback. That means there's, uh, excuse me, uh, replay. That means there's activity that captures information about singing in the adult bird while the animal is uh, sleeping. And we also know that that information changes the patterns of activity. So that's, if sleep is going to be important for regulating, fine-tuning the behavior at night, then something has to change. And we actually see evidence for that, which is that the patterns of bursts before a period of sleep and after a period of sleep are frequently different. And you know, obviously, it's 
highly statistically significant in this sample that whatever it is, the 10 times the bird sang and the neuron fired at some part of song, they're very different before sleep and after sleep. Is there any evidence for a song pattern uh, when the bird is awake but it's not singing, so maybe just thinking about the song? So we don't have evidence for that. But there are uh, surprises here. There's a general pattern of loss of spikes. So the number of spikes before singing is uh, higher than the number of spikes after singing. And that seems to continue all the time. We're all, you know, we all recognize that that doesn't work. Somehow the system can't go to zero spikes. So there has to be a mechanism for putting spikes into the system again, and we don't know what that is. So maybe we're, it's just statistically it's a small number of cells that turn on suddenly. So as some cells turn off, others turn on, and we haven't seen that yet. So it could occur in those cells, and we don't know it. There's also evidence for pre-play, that is, that the nervous system uh, preparing to change the activity during sleep prior to singing during the day. OK. So the last phenomenon that I want to tell you about uh, singing is uh, 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 singing and sleep uh, is that when the animal sleeps, then all of a sudden the nervous system becomes, in this species, becomes sensitive to sensory information, in particular playback of the individual bird's own song. So the neurons, when the animal is awake in this species, not in other species, won't respond to playback of the bird's own song. These neurons won't, these RA neurons. But when the animal is asleep, they do respond to playback of the bird's own song. And again, they respond in a way that's similar to the replay phenomenon. They capture features. This is the auditory response in the sleeping bird. This is the motor response. Whenever they respond, they respond in a way as if the animal was singing. So this is what we call fictive singing. And experimentally, it's very valuable. Now we can take a bird, and it's still hard to do, but we can do it. We can record in the sleeping bird, and it's, we can get information as if the bird was singing. So that's very powerful. I want to give you a sense for how powerful this uh, behavior is with another video. So now, instead of a singing bird, we have a sleeping bird. It's, as far as the bird is concerned, it's dark in the cage. We're using, uh, we're looking, using IR to look at the bird. Uh, video IR. The bird's going to be sleeping. He's going to hear playback of the bird's own song, and you're going to hear the neuron respond. That's the neuron. That's the song. You hear that bursting pattern just as if the bird was singing, as you heard before. And now we hear it again. Very strong response, some, some spontaneous bursting. And now, I think now, the animal is going to wake himself up. We didn't do anything. And listen to what happens to the neurons. No response. The animal's awake. There's no response. Now the animal falls asleep. You may not be able to tell. The eye closes right there. Listen. There's a good response again. And now it's been going on along all the time. Let's see if you can see the tail here of all things. So there's a whole lot of behavior that's being released by this uh, 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 playback of song. And again, all these become very powerful constraints on model building if you want to build a network that has RA, HVC, and... Similar experiments with humans. Yes. Yes. And similar results. 